The church at Antioch in Syria could have been named the first Christian church. It was here that the believers in Jesus Christ, both Jews and Gentiles, first came to be called Christians. And it was from here that the first missionary journey was launched. The apostles went first to Cyprus, the island where Barnabas was born, and after spreading the gospel there, it was time to move onward. And so it is also time for us to move onward in our study on the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. We come to lesson number six, the first missionary journey, churches planted. Acts 13 verse 13 tells us, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. For the first time, Paul was entering lands that had never heard of Jesus Christ. This had always been Paul's stated intent. In his letter to the Romans, he expressed his long-held personal ambition in Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named lest I should build on another man's foundation, Romans 15:20. However, the venture to the shores of modern-day Turkey did not begin smoothly. It began with a conflict in that John Mark returned to Jerusalem. We don't know the reason for his departure. Was it homesickness, fear, doctrinal disagreements, personality conflicts, anger at leaving Cyprus so quickly? We can only speculate. But Paul definitely considered it desertion. Later, at the onset of the second missionary journey, we will see how this desertion led to further conflict. We will look more carefully at the situation when we come to that lesson. But for now, we shall lay it aside and continue our study into the first missionary journey as Paul and Barnabas go about spreading the gospel in new territories and planting churches. It does not appear that the apostles remained in Perga very long. They went to the city called Pisidian Antioch. Obviously, there was more than one city by the name of Antioch, and to distinguish this one from Antioch in Syria, it came to be known as Pisidian Antioch. This Roman city was actually located in Phrygia, just across the border from Pisidia. A traveler arriving on the coast, as our missionaries did, would travel inland from the region of Pamphylia through the region of Pisidia until reaching this Antioch in Phrygia. The Phrygians were known throughout the Roman Empire as people with brawn but no brains. As a result, they were often placed into servitude, and the name Phrygian became a derogatory term, a kind of insult or slang word for slave. This fact may have added to the trouble which would soon arise. Paul and Barnabas went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and Paul was asked, as was customary for a visiting rabbi, if he had any words of encouragement for the congregation. Paul's sermon had a powerful impact on the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles who also attended. He presented the full message of salvation and pointed everyone to Jesus as Savior. Acts 13, 42-44 And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. What a great start. Everything went perfectly. A church could be planted without any problems, right? Wrong. The religious leaders of the synagogue were filled with jealousy, and no doubt, they must have felt threatened. They had spent so much time and effort to proselytize the pagan Phrygians, and now these strangers come along claiming that faith in Jesus is sufficient for salvation. Such an attack on their legalism could not be tolerated, so they talked abusively against Paul's message. But Paul and Barnabas answered boldly, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. They even quoted Isaiah 49, 6, a messianic prophecy that Jesus would be a light unto the Gentiles unto the ends of the earth. Some believers believe that this statement by Paul 
that they would now turn to the Gentiles marks a point in history where God is finally rejecting the Jews in favor of creating a Gentile church. This was certainly not Paul's intent. He continued to preach the gospel of grace in any synagogue that would receive him. The message of the gospel is available to everyone, but this proclamation by Paul was aimed at the Jewish leaders of this particular synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. How can we know this? Let's look at three reasons. First, Paul tells us that he loved his fellow Jews so much that he wished himself accursed if it meant his kinsmen could be saved. Paul and Barnabas wanted to see their fellow Jews come to salvation, and they would be patient and tolerant to a point, but they would not stand by and let their Savior be mocked. Acts 14.25 tells us that these Jewish leaders not only contradicted, but also blasphemed against Paul's message. These Jewish leaders deserved an open rebuke. Secondly, a number of Jews and proselytes had already become believers on the first Sabbath. It was the Jewish synagogue leaders who then rejected the word of the Lord out of envy. Thirdly, Paul and Barnabas appreciated anyone who was receptive to the gospel. The self-righteous Jews must have held the same contempt for the Phrygians that the Romans held. But the missionaries regarded them differently. By confronting the Jewish leaders about their sin and turning instead to the Gentiles, the missionaries proved their love and respect for the Phrygians. To the synagogue leaders, the Phrygians were just ignorant trophies to be won. To Paul and Barnabas, they were unique creations of God, for whom Jesus Christ had died on the cross. When God moves powerfully amongst a people group, as we can verify throughout the history of the church, we can anticipate two responses, salvations and persecutions. The Phrygians were so sincere and excited about their new belief that the gospel spread throughout the region. The Jewish leaders then stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas to drive them away. Whenever there is a great response to the gospel, persecution will follow, or dissensions, or false teachers. But that is to be expected. Jesus warned, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. The expulsion from Pisidian Antioch may have been an occasion for one of the beatings that Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians 11.25. Paul and Barnabas would have been brought before the magistrates of the Roman colony. Charges would have been made and a sentence imposed to remove them from the region. Expulsion always included a beating with the fasces, a bundle of rods wrapped around an axe, a symbol of the magistrate's authority and the means of punishment. The instrument used for punishment would depend upon the seriousness of the crime, the acts for capital offenses, and the rods for lesser offenses. After a beating with the rods, the missionaries would have been dragged to the boundary of the city and pushed out. But the new believers did not abandon the faith. Instead, they rejoiced. They were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Paul's doctrines included a belief in suffering for Christ's sake and enduring to the end. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The missionaries did not pity themselves. They did not give up and turn back. They did not worry or complain. They shook the dust from their feet in protest and moved on to the next town, just as Jesus had instructed his 12 disciples when he first sent them out. Matthew 10.15 the scenario that happened at Pisidian Antioch occurred again in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas preached at the synagogue and stayed for a while, performing signs and wonders. Many Jews and Gentiles believed, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up strife and a plot to stone them. This time the apostles learned of the plot and left of their own accord to the cities of Lystra and Derbe. The Roman colony of Lystra was founded by Augustus Caesar, and was located about 25 miles southwest of Iconium, a good two days journey away. The main gods of this city were Zeus and Hermes. The temple of Zeus was near the city, and there was a legend that the two Greek gods had come to Lystra in the distant past disguised as humans and had promised to return someday. When the missionaries arrived in Lystra, Paul immediately began speaking publicly about Jesus Christ, and he saw a crippled man with the faith to be healed. So he yelled at him to stand up, and the man was healed. 
Now normally a miracle of this nature would validate Paul's testimony concerning Jesus and open the door to the gospel, such as took place on Cyprus. But because of the old Greek myth, the people of this city began worshiping Barnabas as Zeus and Paul as Hermes, the messenger god, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. The rejection of the worship was not well received by the people of Lystra. Some Jews from Antioch and Iconium used the occasion to stir up the crowd until they stoned Paul and left him for dead outside the city. Barnabas and some new converts helped Paul escape to Derby, where he could recover from his wounds. It may have been to some of these kind people in Derby that Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Galatians 4, 13 and 14. This may also have been the period of time in which Timothy was added to the church along with his mother and grandmother. Once the winter had passed, Paul and Barnabas returned to all the cities where they had planted churches. They were overjoyed to discover that the believers had remained faithful and even more had been added to their number. They encouraged and taught for a short period of time to strengthen the believers in their faith. They appointed elders to lead the congregations and prayed and fasted before dedicating the new leaders to the Lord. Having completed their mission, the two apostles returned to Antioch and Syria and reported to their sending church how that God had opened the door to the Gentiles. What a joyous occasion that must have been. This concludes the video portion of this lesson. Continue now with your facilitator and join us again in our next lesson when we explore the depth and meaning of Paul's teachings concerning God's grace.